Hello and welcome to Design Emergency. I'm Alice Rawsthorne, co-founder of Design Emergency with Paola Antonelli, and we're thrilled that in this episode we'll meet the plantsman and garden designer Pete Audolf, whose years of research into plants and their behaviour has transformed our expectations of gardens and landscapes and revived hundreds of long obscure species. So Pete, thank you very much for joining us. Pete is speaking to us from Hummelo in the Eastern Netherlands, where he lives, works, and with his wife, Anya, has established a living laboratory of plants to study for use in his planting schemes, including those for Millennium Park in Chicago, the Vitra campus near Basel, and his most famous project, the High Line, the public garden on a disused elevated railroad in Manhattan, which is visited by millions of people every year and has inspired scores of similar projects all over the world. The great garden designers of the past were renowned for creating visual spectacles and designed their planting schemes accordingly. But Pete is a leader of the new perennial movement whose designs are determined by how plants evolve and respond to one another, often using wildflowers, grasses, long forgotten local species and those dismissed as weeds in naturalistic planting schemes that are designed to last year after year. So Pete, how did you first become interested in plants, gardens and landscape and what convinced you to make it your life's work? Now, yeah, it was a long time ago, you can imagine, but I think it was that I grew up in, a, in you know, my parents had a restaurant and pub and I grew up there and was, uh, you know, I didn't know anything else than just uh, where I lived and, and, and sort of social life and I, uh, I grew up there, I worked in the bar and restaurant for, for many years and uh, I got married with Anya and I think in the year 70, 1970, I suddenly realized, is this what I'm going to do all my life? And I think that it started to work in my head and uh, I got the idea, I, I need to do something else, you know, I don't want to be locked up here for all my life. And, so I, I started to look for jobs and I didn't know really what I liked at that moment. So I thought I'd just start taking jobs on uh, to see if there's anything that I probably would like. And I came from the fish industry. I worked in, uh, in yeah, factories and, and suddenly I came to work in a garden center for the winter for selling Christmas trees. And I think after that, it was in December, was quite cold and I think they asked me to work a little bit longer and uh, they needed help in the potting shed. So I, I, I said yes. So I started to work at plants for the first time in my life. I was never interested in plants. I just uh, started to work in the shed to dividing plants and just to put them up for the new season and I think that was the, the moment that I, it was a garden center so I, I I had a bookshop, so I, I looked into the bookshop, bought some plant books, took them home, read them, because I didn't know what I was doing, you know, all the plants that, I, 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 that went through my hands, they were unknown, they didn't look good even, they didn't look nice, so I, but I still I, I wanted to know what they were, and so that is how my interest started in the beginning. And then it was spring, they asked me to come over uh, and work in the nursery, and so for just for weeding and, and anything else and I saw trees and I in fact I, I started to buy plants for my mother's garden and so that is how it started so it started slowly but suddenly after half a year it yeah you know, it, it struck me so much that I I really wanted to know more so yeah so I went back to school in one way in evening school for a few years I started to work for a uh, a uh, landscape contractor, a very good one, who did maintenance and, and I, I learned a lot there and also going to school. So in 1975 I had my license and started for myself with, a, with Anja uh, in Haarlem, the city of Haarlem, with a small, uh, how you say, design office, uh, designing small gardens, private gardens and, and uh, my focus was on plants, so even in the early years of starting my own business, people were aware of that my gardens were different, different than just uh, terraces and stone and uh, logistics and, uh, and infrastructure. So plants were always the sort of main thing, the starting point of my design. So 
that is how it all started. And it's a long story, you know that. <laughs> Well, it's a wonderful, circuitous way to discover um, a true passion. So it is a wonderful tale. And I know that you're very passionate about the history of, of garden design. So can you tell us which um, types of gardens and which garden designers most interested you at the time and how your interests then developed? Yeah, I don't know if I really had interest. I was curious, you know, I, I, we traveled a lot in England to uh, gardens, all the main and, and very uh, well-known gardens, and we were, I was really struck by them, you know, the places where, you know, like Sissinghurst and, and, and Great Dexter, all these places of still fame. But uh, at that time, uh, English gardens were the sort of main goal of our, our visits, and we also went to, went to visit nurseries and looked at plants, so uh, certainly all my life was handling around plants you know, traveling to gardens, also with my children, with Anya in England. And that was uh, just before we started here, uh, started our own nursery here in Hermelo, where we live, still live. So England was a sort of, you know, birthplace of gardens, we felt, and we could learn a lot. It's, uh, uh, a lot was about beautiful plants, decorative gardens, uh, a lot of craftsmanship. And I, I thought I wanted to learn that as well. So, and uh, but then came the moment that we uh, we moved to Hamelo where we live, and then we came in a situation that we there was no time to to design um, because we had to build up a farmhouse that was derelict. We we started a nursery, and uh, that nursery became very well known. I had no time to design because it was hard working, and we had to uh, yeah to produce plants, and we had to. Uh, yeah, to make a nursery working, uh, we had to create planting beds and everything. So there was a lot of work the first first five five years to get established, and we hardly survived. But uh, by selling some of my, I had a toy collection, I had some things that I could sell. So we survived those five years, and at that time we got the first clients uh, that came over. And in the meantime, we also started the sort of open days for nurseries. We invited other nursery people to come over. That also attracted more people from all over the country. Our plant collection became well known because we collected them not only from England, but also from uh, Germany. And so we became a hub for plants people. So they could find plants from England uh, when they came from Germany or Denmark or other places. And the English gardeners could find plants that we collected here in Europe. So that was the beginning and that uh, also there were conferences about uh, uh, perennials. Uh, you know, there was a whole sort of clan of people that looked at each other, that talked to each other. And also uh, at that time, when I started to design again, I had the idea that I did want to make the gardens that we saw as traditional. I had the idea that we could make something different. I missed at that time a sort of spontaneity in gardens and a sort of personal thing. And I think by meeting people from the wild side of gardening, you know, people from nature preserves and, and sort of uh, people that at the time that was also in the 70s, wild gardening was also a sort of thing that happened. But by talking to them and about my idea that I would like to have more spontaneity in the gardens, I came slowly into a kind of gardening, which I still do, but more advanced and more more trained and more uh, worked out. So at that time we started to use grasses and plants that were unusual and hardly seen in gardens. So not only natives, but plants that had this more natural look. And uh, and together with grasses, we uh, suddenly all these gardens changed. You know, when you put grasses in your garden, suddenly the idea of decorative changes into more uh, naturalistic, you know, because grasses has this sort of appeal that when you see grasses, you look, you think of uh, of the wild, you know, and think of meadows, and that's what happened at that time. And so can you describe the early projects that you worked on where you were really able to realize all this research into grasses, 
wildflowers, other plants that had been dismissed for so long? Yeah, mostly we did it in our own property here on the nursery side. You know, we have three acres and so we transformed the, gar uh, the nursery, uh, the, our gardens to gardens that were open for the public. And we did those, we filled those gar the gardens in in our own way, so with the plants we liked. So, and that took attention from people and also from uh, the media that it was different than people's they, than gardens they knew that you saw in magazines. So, uh, yeah, they came to see us, and articles were written uh, at that time about the way we gardened, and also uh, in the early 90s we we. Uh, we made a book. I, I'm not a writer, but you know, I cooperated with Hank Harrison, who was a sort of, yeah, uh, uh, my counterpart. He came from the wild side of gardening, and I was more from the garden side of gardening. And uh, so, altogether, we wrote a book about uh, dream plants, a new generation of garden plants. So, that addressed a lot of plants that were not known in gardens and also. Uh, gave some critics on plants, positive and even negative, of, and, and that book became a sort of first well-known book. Uh, the second, I think it's also translated, maybe the second edition is translated into uh, Dream Plants for the Natural Garden, uh, you probably know that, but um, that was in the early 90s, uh, that's also 35 years ago. And I think also uh, my uh, by seeing people and conferences, I was asked by a director of public parks in Sweden to do a small park in uh, near Stockholm, and that was in 1996. And that park became an example for Swedish parks because it was so different than what people knew, that uh, that uh, it was well published. And also my work in England for my friend John Cook, Bury Court, a private garden that became very well known, uh, uh, published many times, so that evolved into sort of my career of uh, being asked to do gardens uh, outside the, and first of course mainly private, but uh, since uh, Antwerping, the Swedish garden, I was asked to do the Chelsea Flower Show in 2000 with Gardens Illustrated. And from there on, I was asked to do a Borders at Wisley, the RHS Gardens. I was asked to do the entrance of a botanical garden in Toronto. I was, uh, yeah. So suddenly my work moved outside the private realm, you know, into more public. And I think that is why my work became well known, because in private you, gardens are hidden, mostly, uh, made for families. So uh, I think that was the start of all what is happening now. And could you describe to us your, your design and planting strategy for, for one of those gardens, the thinking behind it? No, I'd say the thinking behind it is the development before that. You know, that is uh, how it all, I made gardens and they developed, I, I created knowledge, I, I gathered knowledge from what went wrong and of course what went well and so I could bring up a pallet that would work and was strong enough to use in public. I think that is one thing, uh, but uh, in fact my strategy is just talk to the client and, and ask what he wants and what he, and what he yeah, that's the first part. And then uh, your design strategy is that you start with uh, the ideas you get from that brief and from also from uh, the place where it's going to happen. So. All places where you go to, um, they are lim have, have limitations. So, you know, in, in public space, there's a sort of safety uh, regulations, there's a sort of uh, general regulations that you cannot go around. I think uh, that in private gardens, there's more freedom, but then there's the restrictions of we have children, we want this and that. So there's always something that you have to think about, and that is the starting point for your design. And then you start first with the infrastructure, you know, how can we go from A to B and from C to D and, uh, and uh, the easiest way to go to your garden. Then you think about how can we keep people longer in the garden and just going from A to B and just make it interesting. So then you start to think about the planting concept. 
And, for, and it is first about trees you want to plant, and then the shrubs, and then the places that should be open, places for people to sit. And you know, there's a whole a sort of list you put together where you start from. But uh, first, with all the hardware, and uh, let's say all that has to be built to make you go well to the garden and make it easy to sit and relax. And then you go, you start with your planting design, and that is. Uh, yeah, it's a moment of, uh, uh, in fact, if I have to say it's short, that comes together by all the information you have and the situation you're in and the background and the context and so on. And so if we talk about what's still your most famous project, the High Line, which has had a, a huge impact. Obviously, it was a collaboration with Dilla Scafidio Renfro, the architects, and James Corner, who initiated the project. Could you um, explain the thinking behind the, the initial planting and also how it's evolved in subsequent years and whether the fact that so many people have visited the site has changed it in a particular way because of the stresses that has added to it? No, it was in 2004 that I was asked to be a sort of horticultural advisor for the, for the High Line and that, uh, you know, I came over for the first time. I already was working on the battery gardens, you know, on the battery conservancy gardens at the south tip of, uh, of Manhattan. And I think that was, because I was in New York already, I thought, okay, this is, uh, you know, always doubt when people come with something new, you never know how it will work. It's, it was rather big and long. It was uh, one and a half mile long. and. But um, it was very tempting because when I looked it up on the internet, I saw people advocating for that high line to keep it and so on. So I thought, okay, I can combine it when I'm in New York. And uh, so I stepped into the team in 2004, and, uh, but I think nobody had the idea that it would become so famous and so much a landmark, uh, what it is now. So in the beginning you're open, you think, okay, that's you know, we walked the Highland several times, then the first concepts came from by, by the architects and landscape architects, and then at the end it ended up as a narrative, you know, from again so forth, wood, and I think uh, field operations created that narrative that walking over the Highland you came from one in another area, from woodland in meadow, half an open meadow, in more a naturalistic or more uh, preserve areas and that story you know these chapters gave me the ideas for what I could do if people say woodland and I have an idea I have a picture in mind if they say half open woodland with understory and and uh, ground covers then the picture come up automatically so that so it was easy for me because uh, easy and difficult because I was used to work in a sort of more traditional way more block planting and not in that sort of wild idea that we have created at that, that time, but I was already sort of uh, practicing it on a very small scale here in my garden. So, and with that narrative, I could see it in front of me, how to put that together. So very naturalistic. I think is after the Lurie Garden, where I tried a little piece with a more sort of wild idea, or like a preserve for real wild, uh, but really natives and and that it really looked as it was natural. I started to do that on the High Line for the first time on a very large scale. So, and that worked out very well, but it was a, a, you know, a big exercise. But the good thing is that we had this sort of narrative that was most important, that the architect gave me the sort of direction. This is what we want here not the choice of plants, but we see this as woodland, we see this as meadow, we see this as a nature preserve, and, and that gave me the idea that I could work on it. That was um, complicated, but it worked out quite well. And is the original planting plan, is that still in place, or have you refined it over the years? No, you have to, because every planting you do is, is uh, the moment you start it, there's a process going of getting older and, and getting sort of uh, trees grow bigger. So um, plants push other plants out because in the, 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 the situations uh, uh, get are changing because you know if a tree grows, there's more pressure for plants around it, and 
and um, there's less space sometimes for plants. So you have to take action uh, of things that you see that will change. So we do that by a conversation, by an assessment, by talking about what shall we do, but it never stays uh, to the planting plan and what it is. Uh, you could do it all over, but then you have to rip everything out and then you can do it again. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, during all this, over the years, you have to act on, uh, on the situation. And so once a garden or landscape has been planted, what needs to happen to ensure that it will thrive and how involved are you in that process? No, it's good to stay involved, but it's a matter of having the good stewardship, you know, people that know that it has to be taken care of and you need a great gardener, you know, that understand. Uh, most important is people understand plants and what they do and that needs a big knowledge of plants and also an understanding of what can happen and if things happen that you see it, you know, you cannot just sit there with your eyes closed and, uh, and, and enjoy it, you know, it's watching and, 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 and watching and enjoying it. That, that is what we do, you know, if I walk into my own garden, I watch it and see what goes wrong, at the same time I enjoy it, you know, and uh, that's what a, a big garden, especially a public garden, should, should, should have. Uh, the right people in the right place with the right knowledge. Not always easy, I can imagine, you can imagine that there are gardens that people don't think about that or at least doesn't matter when, even if you have told it, they have their own ideas about maintenance and uh, you know, they, some, sometimes they think they can do it just with a contractor, which is not true. You need really a horticultural person. So presumably when prospective clients approach you, critically you have to make the assessment as to whether they will be committed to ensuring that all of that is properly in place. Yeah. And did you ever feel there was a risk of you becoming known as sort of Mr. Highline, being focused on that work forever? That clearly hasn't happened because you've had so many extraordinary projects since. But I imagine it's both a blessing and a curse to be so closely associated with such a famous garden. No, we, we are quite isolated here in the, in the place where we live. So it's not, and, and of course, I'm not a well-known face, maybe a well-known name. Uh, so people don't, it's not that you'll be recognized on the streets. Uh, so you're a well-known person, but more, maybe more imaginative by like people that know your name, what you've done. I notice when many people know me, but they know, don't know me by face, which is, I think, kind of lucky, being lucky, you know. I'm sure many people would envy you for that. Given that you have so many existing projects that you constantly want to check in on and have also taken on so many new projects, how do you manage that process with so many calls on your time and what's your support structure like in terms of other people with different skills no, i'm i'm i've been lucky you know i work on my own we we, we live in the, in the in the remote you know so i always had to uh, rely on the network and i built that up over the years in, in the usa you know we have people like Austin Enscheid, Hannah Packer. Uh, Roy Deblik. In the Netherlands we have a network of people that really know our plants and they help me with the implementation. They know exactly to work from my drawings into the field. I think that is for me the most important thing, you know, that I can not only design, be in a place, but also that have the people you can rely on when you need them, when the gardens are installed and also with landscape architects together. So all together it's uh, I, I built on a big network, you know, that I have built up over the years that can help me when necessary with the knowledge. And it's all about plants also, the knowledge of plants, also sometimes technical. But uh, that's how I can work, you know, being able to work and still. Did you ever try working with a bigger established team, with more people working with you in Hungerlo? No, we, we tried it when we had the nursery, we had some people employed that was for the nursery, but because I had to travel uh, for, from, for, for my work, uh, for design work uh, in Europe and other places, uh, leaving someone in the office that don't know about plants, I think you need to know, in my work you need to know about plants, not about design, I could do that myself and otherwise when I work with architects they do the, the, the master planning. So I tried it a few times with interns, but uh, it never worked out. I had to go, you know. Uh, 
and then they were in the office. When we had a nursery, they could work on the nursery and learn plants, but when we stopped the nursery, we had to stop that. That never, there were occasions, but I think because I worked it out as it is now, that was always the best way. And now, of course, at my age, it still is, you know, can imagine. So, on your own, and everyone is free around me, inclusive me. How do you feel that public perceptions of gardens and garden design have changed during your career? I would assume that there is significantly greater interest in the field now than there was even 10, 20 years ago. Now, we started with the ideas, I think, in the 90s. So, you know, that is um, the mid 80s, uh, 90, 40 years ago. So you can imagine that uh, if you put that in, in the context of the time we live in, then it's quite a sort of, if it is normal what we do now, because it, it responds to uh, uh, the situation of our climate and uh, everything else. But we did it from intuitive, you know, that we felt that it's not the waste at the time because we watered and we did everything that you know we wouldn't do would do less now but it was more the idea that we missed the sort of spontaneity the wildness and i think the more you uh, we got in it uh, the more you felt more uh, relaxed and more it was something that feel comfortable more than than this sort of and i still like english gardens you know i still like the craftsmanship everything that happens so it's not that i bend that out no it's just more that i follow my own ideas about what i liked and and suddenly that uh, had a reaction uh, all over the world of, of people that are gardening now and do you continue to discover new plants or observe variations in the way plants behave in in other words you've obviously built up a significant body of knowledge throughout your working life but are you still surprised uh yeah i'm surprised that surprised about myself that i do think that i still afterwards think i shouldn't have done you know i'm too too much a plant lover <laughs> that sometimes i i still against better knowing uh, uh, I use plants against better knowing you know they they fail sometimes so that's one thing uh, because my, my love for plants is so high that I want to show them to people and not always in the right situation so not much but uh, I can go around myself sometimes and that is not good you have to be sort of pure and think about what is really really uh, it's just a little accent you know that I, I, I I see in myself that, uh, but for the rest, I think that I see sometimes plants that, wild plants, species that live for hundreds of years already, uh, uh, also nurseries that I think, okay, but that comes back, you know, then you see plants that you denied 20 years ago because you didn't like them, uh, they were not wild, they were maybe not in the right ones in your eyes and now you suddenly like them again you know i don't know it comes back and forward so the liking and the not liking of particular plants but and we find new species that are uh come for yeah that we, we can use in gardens but not the species were there you know suddenly you realize okay that's a good plant i could use since the high line could you give us a couple of examples of particular gardens that you've worked on that have pose very different challenges to you? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think Nantucket, I think that island and Nantucket, we worked for a family. Yeah, also with field operations, James Corner, that was a challenge. Yeah, there are many big, every, every garden is, uh, creates challenges, but you know, if you're afraid, you never do it again, you know, that it's more <laughs> afterwards, sometimes you think, oh, here we are again with 70,000 new plants to install. And you know, the responsibility you have, in fact, because it has to work, that is big, but you never realize that because your, your intention is so big that you, you don't see the negative things of what you do, you only see what can go right. Uh, but. Uh, but the challenge, the, every garden is a challenge, you know, big or small, because there's always someone or more people that watching you and see if it goes right. And what are you working on now? Yeah, we work on the Calder Gardens, 
in uh, Philadelphia. That's a new museum for Calderon. I would love to do we would for uh, in Chicago for our neighborhood garden, Sears Sunken Garden. We try to do that something with the com community there. And I think that's the new, we are working on a Swedish museum. We are um, just installed half of the planting. So that is three. We have some smaller gardens here, but, and also a museum here in the Netherlands. We just are busy planting. So there's enough to do. Sometimes I forget half of, of the gardens I'm doing, but because they don't pop up correctly. Um and how would you like your work to develop in the future? Getting better uh, understanding of uh, complexity it is. So uh, for my work, I need good people to take care of it. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, I can develop the way I, I, I become stronger in my design. Probably I know more every year. You learn from yourself what I said. But it's all about who's taking care. Do my clients understand that people have to take care? I think that's my main concern every garden you do. And I can't tell you many things go wrong, but luckily many things go right too. Huh? But all has to do with, with people that take care. Not with, not with the planting scheme or whatever. It has to do with, you know, with how people think about gardens because in, in, uh, in fact, everyone is a gardener. Yeah? We all love plants. And as soon as we plant a plant in our garden, we think we are gardeners. And, uh, but that is good. But uh, in my work, I need a little bit more. Uh, well, that is a wonderful way to end. So, Pete, thank you so much for sharing your, your time and your work with us. It's been wonderful to hear about it. And thank you to everyone for listening. You can find images of all the projects that we've discussed on our Instagram feed at design.emergency. And we look forward to welcoming you back to the Design Emergency podcast soon, when we'll be talking to another remarkable force in design now and in the future. So Pete, thank you again and goodbye.